The earth was dark through misapprehension of God. That the gloomy shadows might be lightened, that the world might be brought back to God, Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love Him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. This work only one being in all the universe could do. Only he who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it known. Upon the world's dark night, the Son of Righteousness must rise with healing in his wings. continuing our studies in uh, this wonderful message of God's character. We had been looking at the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ, in this great controversy, how he deals with sin and sinners. We are thankful for the revelations so far, and we're going to go a little further. We are now looking at the great controversy from the point of view of the lies that Satan told about God and how Christ himself was able to clear up those lies. I invite you to pray with me as we begin. Father in heaven, we are truly grateful and thankful for this grand opportunity that you've given to each and every one of us that we can investigate the issues involved in a great controversy because we know that you will not leave your children ignorant Ignorance is not blessed. Ignorance is destruction. And we are thankful that you, has, you have made us wise by sending your son to clear up the issues, to show the truth, to bring the light through the darkness so that we can have the correct understanding of your character and be saved. We thank you. Draw close to us at this time. Continue to teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. I am thankful for our God. His desire from the days of eternity was to have beings as free as he is. And yet, as so fixed in righteousness as he is, that there will be no possibility of their thinking that there is another way that can work but the way of righteousness. God has been committed, and God is committed, to the path of righteousness eternally. And God wants for creatures who inhabit time to be as eternally committed to the path of righteousness as he is, because they are as certain as he is that the path of righteousness, in that path there is life. There is no death. There is no darkness. And they are also as certain as he is that any variation from that path is death. They are so convinced that they will never turn. So God went about creating and he created man. And we are told in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, he made man in his own image after his likeness. And he gave man dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air. And over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now when he made man, we are told that man was made a little lower than the angels. Man was made a little lower than the angels. We have bodies that are called terrestrial bodies. While the, while the bodies of the angels are called celestial bodies. Spirit bodies. And uh, we are given the account here. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, it says, 
and out of the ground may the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So as man was made from the dust of the ground, God knew that in order for man to continue to exist, he needed that which came from the ground to keep him going. So man was made from the dust of the ground, and we needed the minerals that came from the ground to sustain our bodies. So God could have given us dust to eat. That would not be very tasty. But you know what God did? God is a lovely God. And he believes in uh, loveliness. And uh, that is why I love to come uh, to Idaho and Washington. Because uh, the way the food is presented, the way it is packaged, it is appetizing. And it gives you a desire to eat. And if you're not careful, you go to gluttony. But we thank God for the grace of Jesus Christ. What God did... Rather than telling man that he has to eat the dust to get the minerals from the dust, he packaged the minerals in fruit. And he says, eat of that fruit. He says in Genesis chapter 2 verse 9, And the Lord God made the, and out of the ground, made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for, for food. So, there's a category of trees that God made for food. And he says, of that category of trees, I want you to freely eat. Then he says, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This is very interesting, because he says, Every tree was good for food, and now he gave us a category of trees that were not designed for eating commonly. But we were supposed to eat of the tree of life. But eating of the tree of life was not designed for the purpose for which we think. It was a representation of something else. The tree of life was not here to give man immortality in itself. Because anything that gives immortality must be God. And if we think that the tree itself can give immortality, then we are saying that the tree is God, and we therefore become heathen, worshiping nature. So there's nothing immortal in a tree. When, we, when Adam ate of that tree, it was a representation of his dependence upon and his partaking of the life of God in Jesus Christ. But then, he says, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Consider a command now that God gave to man. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. So God gave us a command to be free. I like that. That is one of the first, most beautiful gifts that God gave to humanity. Freedom. Freedom. God says, I want you to be free. I am free. And I want you to be free. However, your freedom really can only be maintained within the context of certain boundaries. The boundary of freedom is righteousness. Remember, when God says every tree, he was not therefore speaking with a specific reference to two particular trees. Let us notice something. There was an exception. He says, but, 
But it's a conjunction denoting a contrast from what was said before. So when he says, of every tree thou mayest freely eat, he was not telling them that every tree that was made, you should eat from it. But that every tree, therefore, was within the context of the trees that were good for food, that was pleasant to the eyes, that was designed for the purpose of sustaining man on earth. Because it says, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. What is God here saying? God was very clear in what he said to man. The command was too clear to be misunderstood. And the consequence for breaking the command was just as clear and just as certain as the command itself. So that we can understand what God has said, we want now to examine a little bit of what he did not say. Because sometimes it is in looking at what was not said that you can more clearly understand what actually was said. Now, God said that if man ate of the tree, he will surely die. Did God mean by this that if man sinned, if he disobeyed God, if he ate of the tree, that he will cause him to die? Did he mean that? You see, at the very beginning, God informed man of the consequences of sin, which is death. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says that the wages of sin is death. So at the very beginning of man's existence, God says, I have given to you freedom. But within the context of freedom, there is righteousness. There is obedience. And therefore, your freedom will only be maintained so long as you are walking in righteousness because it is sin that brings into bondage. So, God did say that death will come at the very beginning. The big question is, how will man die if he disobeyed God? That is the question. There are those who believe that when man sins, that in order to get rid of sin, God has to arbitrarily intervene by killing the man to get rid of sin. Did God mean that? Did God mean that if, Adam, you disobey me, it is going to cause me to come against you and to take the life that I have given to you because uh, you have offended me. Now, if that was God's way of dealing with sin, I, I think that God would be a rather unfair God. Why? Why? Man was not the first sinner in the universe. And uh, if God meant by telling Adam, if you sin, I will take away your life, then why did he not take away Satan's life when he sinned? God would have been unfair. For sure we know that God is not the executioner of those who sin against him. The very presence of Satan and all of his angels in this world is a demonstration that God does not kill the sinner. And it is a demonstration that God will not win the great controversy by snuffing out the life of his enemies. Clear demonstration. A man decides 
that he's going to rape and kill 10 women. Is that bad? Yes, that, that is bad. So, in order for God to prevent that man from doing that, he has to kill him. And yet God turns his eyes from men who have committed genocide, massacres. And God turn, turns his eyes from uh, Satan who is responsible for the death of one third of his angels and from, for the whole world who have gone into sin. Why would God therefore deal with one puny man that can only affect a small circle and will not go against the King Bing? It reminds me of drug lords. They are up in the high and mighty places and they have their little pawns out there and their little pawns out there, they are the ones who get it put in prison and the drug lords are on the loose. That is the problem that we are having in our world in believing that God has to kill a man to get rid of sin. If he had, if he had to use that method to stop sin, if God were to use the method of killing the sinner in order to get rid of sin, God is a big, unfair being because God could have stopped it at the very beginning. As soon as Satan sinned, God could have gotten rid of him. And therefore one third of the heavenly angels would not have fallen and man would not have fallen through his influence. And therefore if God did not kill Satan, the first sinner, at the beginning of the great controversy. In order to get rid of sin, why would he therefore have to employ that method at the end of the great controversy? It does not make sense. The issues, therefore, are more important to be understood rather than God killing the sinner to get rid of sin. More issues in this great controversy. We are told Christ came to earth for a reason. What was that reason? To destroy the works of the devil. You see, God is not dealing with men. He's dealing with a philosophy. And the philosophy is that in order for you to live, in order for you to be happy, in order for you to be exalted, you have to be your own God. You don't need God. That is what Satan sold to the angels in heaven. That is what he sold to Eve and Adam in the Garden of Eden. And that is what he's selling to the world today. That they can be their own God. And Christ, rather than exalting himself, destroyed the works of the devil by stepping down, by humility. That is what wins the day. Not how powerful we are, but how humble we are. It is not power that wins the great controversy. It is humility that does it. God does not kill the sinner. If God kills the sinner, he should have killed Satan long ago. And rather than hurting or killing Satan, we are told in Ezekiel chapter 31 that when Satan is ultimately destroyed, he says, I will cause a mourning for him in Lebanon. Reminds me of a wonderful story of a man that people looked upon as foolish. That was David. Absalom came against David and David ran from his throne. David, David said, I would prefer leave my throne rather than blood be shed in the capital of the city of the Lord. David left his throne and was in the wilderness and his son parading. And then the time came when the tables were turned. And rather than David saying, ensure that my enemy is destroyed, David is seen as saying, save the life of the lad. And when he heard that his son was dead, he mourned and he wept and he wept. That is a revelation of the character of God. That is a revelation of how God dealt with Lucifer. That is a revelation of how God deals with every single sinner. Save the lad. But if 
is destroyed. God weeps. He weeps. He weeps. He does not stand towards the sinner as, as, an, as an executioner. I like this statement here. Wonderful book, the great, book Great Controversy, page 36. It says, We cannot know how much we owe to Christ for the peace and protection which we enjoy. It is the restraining power of God that prevents mankind from passing fully under the control of Satan. The disobedient and unthankful have great reason for gratitude for God's mercy and long-suffering in holding in check the cruel, malignant power of the evil one. But when men pass the limits of divine forbearance, that restraint is removed. God does not stand toward the sinner as an executioner of the sentence against transgressions. Who is the first sinner that ever entered this universe? Satan. And God is saying he will not stand toward Satan as an executioner of the sentence against transgression. Against transgression. But he leaves the rejectors of his mercy to themselves to reap that which they have sown. That is the mechanism of the destruction of every sinner. Every ray of light rejected, every warning despised or unheeded, every passion indulged, every transgression of the law of God is a seed sown which yields its unfailing harvest whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. And if you sow to the spirit, you shall of the spirit reap everlasting life. That is the justice of God. Every, listen to it, every transgression of the law of God is a seed sown which yields its unfailing harvest. The spirit of God persistently resisted is at last withdrawn from the sinner and then there is left no power to control the evil passions of the soul and no protection from the malice and enmity of Satan. Even Satan himself will be left to the consequences of his own choice. So when God said in the very beginning, at the very outset of man's existence on earth, in the day that you eat, you shall surely die. God gave the certainty of death that will come to the sinner. But the thing is, God had a plan, praise the Lord. And his plan, what was his plan? His plan was to take the death of the sinner and set the sinner free. Give him freedom once again. Freedom of choice. Freedom to live. Freedom to love. And freedom to enjoy life. That is what we have in Jesus Christ. So the answer to the question at the beginning of the great controversy on earth will certainly give us the answer to the way that the finally impenitent sinners will be destroyed at the end of the great controversy. For their destruction will be the fulfillment of God's word in Genesis chapter 2 verse 17. Thou shalt surely die. So we see here God's argument. What is God's argument in this great controversy? What is God's manifesto? Life. Peace. Happiness. Everything that is good. We are told in James 1, 17. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning. He does not turn from giving good gifts. And if he gives death, that means death is a good gift. But it's not. Death is one of those things manufactured by Satan's kingdom. So we see God's argument. 
we see what God has for each and every one of us. We see God saying, if you move away from the path of righteousness, you will die. Because, as we are told in Proverbs chapter 12, verse 28, in the way of righteousness is life, and in the pathway thereof, there is no death. So we are thankful very much for what God has given to us in Christ. He has given us life. He has given us health. He has given us peace. He has given us happiness. He has given us everything that is wonderful. Because he himself is everything that is wonderful. But as we move away from God, we are certain that there is death. So in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 12, we see that there is absolutely no death in the pathway of righteousness. We see God's argument now. What is Satan's argument? What is Satan's thought? Genesis chapter 3, 1 to 5. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Verse 2. Now notice Satan's argument here, and how he began. Yea, Hath God said, you should not eat of every tree of the garden? The reality is, God did not say this. But what Satan did, he suggested to Eve's mind a thought that included the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in order to draw her into argument with himself. That is Satan's first ploy. Let us not enter Satan's territory and presumptuously go on Satan's ground and seek to enter into discussion with him about God's work. Because I, I know that there are many people who believe that they have to go into the kingdom of devil and fight with the devil. And it reminds me of the seven sons of Sceva. They saw Paul and Silas being used by God in a powerful way even in casting out devils. And they decided that what they're going to do, they want to do the works of all. And they knew a home of a man that had a demon. And they went down into the home of that man. Went on Satan's ground. Not sent by God. And these were Jews. Not sent by God. And they decided that they're going to go in a place where Satan has the ascendancy. Going outside of the protection of God. To do God's work. For their own glory. And when they went into that man's house. They declared, I adjure thee. By the God of Paul. To come out of him. The demon looked at him. Paul I know. Cephas, I know. Jesus, I know. But who are you? And we are told that that one man that was possessed by a demonia took those seven men and stripped them of all their clothes and beat them black and blue. And they were running naked down the road. I'm saying that when we go on Satan's ground unprotected by God, not sent by God, we will be beaten by the enemy black and blue. You can't win in a warfare against Satan. You can't win in a discussion with Satan. Even Jesus himself had only one thing for Satan. It is written. Get thee hence. That's the only thing that Jesus had for Satan. No controversy. You see, this work of the gospel will not be carried by argument but by a demonstration of the life, by a demonstration of the power of God in 
your behavior. So we are not called to enter into Satan's territory. Eve went into Satan's territory. And when she went into Satan's territory, she parlayed with the enemy and discussed with the enemy. Let us stop parlaying with our feelings. The flesh is the enemy's ground. Is that true? Yes, the flesh is the enemy's ground. And whenever we parlay with the feelings of the flesh, we are actually giving Satan the ascendancy. Don't parlay with the feelings. Allow the intellect, the power of God in the intellect to so mold the will that you make a decision on God's word and not upon the feelings of the flesh. That's why we always lose. So the woman responded and to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Was that the word of God? It was not the word of God. In seeking to defend God, she was not clear in understanding the command of God. Because it is only by the word of God that we can have faith. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And when she parlayed with the enemy, there was an adulteration of the word of God with her own philosophy, which caused her to lose faith in God. So you can be a missionary out there, running the world over. And if you don't have the unadulterated, naked word of God, if your word, if your idea of God is mixed with human theories, you will lose faith under circumstances and therefore misrepresent God in your behavior. God did not say, neither shall you touch it. He did not say that. What did God say? He says, if you eat, you shall surely. She says, if you eat or touch, you may die. So she added to God's word and subtracted from the impact of the consequence. And the servant said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. That is the problem with humanity today. They are believing Satan's sophistry that they can rise a higher plane of existence, that they can know for themselves what is right and what is wrong. They don't have to depend upon the word of God. That's why he said, this is, you should know good and evil. You can determine what is right for your life and you can determine what is wrong. You can discern it because you have that innate ability. God is saying, we cannot determine what is right and what is wrong. We are not God. We need the word of God. God's word is our only safeguard. God's word is the only power that can be used to generate faith within us so that we can live a life acceptable to God. I thank God for the power of his word. And I thank God that he has shown us clearly what the truth is. And we will see as we go further the reality of what Satan was actually saying regarding the character of God. But at this time, we thank him for revealing himself to us in Jesus Christ. We don't have to fight against Satan. He says, whenever Satan comes, submit yourself to God, resist the devil, and he must flee. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are truly thankful for the power of your word. We are thankful that in Jesus Christ, we have the true understanding of the issues involved in the great controversy. We have in Jesus Christ the reality that you do not have to kill the sinner, but that the death comes to the sinner by separation from your righteousness. Our prayer is that you would teach us guide us, direct us. Let us not believe Satan's sophistry and his lie that we can know what is good and what is evil in ourselves but that it can only be found in the word of God. That word, generating faith within our, within our hearts, will save us into your kingdom. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, 
and desire to study deeper into the subject of who God is, you may obtain a copy of the book, God's Character, The Best News in the Universe, by calling 509-288-2744 or 208-318-6430. Or you can write to us at Truth in Jesus, PO Box 152, Farmington, Washington, 99128. If you wish to help the worldwide outreach of Truth in Jesus, your gift may be sent to the same address, or you can give a gift online at truthinjesus.org. Thank you for listening.